from here. This is not an academic presentation. We will have to fight. Hi everyone, so we are ready. <laughs> uh, thanks for the patience and uh, we start uh, um, the workshop uh, with uh, Pablo, okay? Thanks. Pablo, please stay here. Um, so the, the video is here if you want here. to see that. Hello, Sakia. I don't see you. So, um, we will, we will begin with the video we sent to you. Uh, this video was created for the Pedetic, the Congress. The idea is to have in advance the information we wanted to discuss at the, at the Congress, in order to have discussions at the Congress. Um, we, had like a, we already have a, a working group in the VDTA oriented to simulation, mathematical simulation. Uh, how many of you are working already with simulation? How many who of you are working already with mathematical simulation? With uh, Francis, Francis, Modelica, Bimola, uh, EcoSimpro, Simulation X. Okay, so you are in a very small group, perspective. Okay. Um, the, the situation uh, we face at, at the beginning of the Sphere project is that uh, when the people preparing the project, they were looking for a solution for doing simulation. Uh, of course, you go, if you are not an expert on simulation, you don't have any expertise, and, and you go to the market and you, you write in internet, uh, simulation software for construction. Wow, you have hundreds of programs, everything is simulation, okay? Uh, when Edward Loscos contacted me for asking me that question, I told him we should go ahead in time, we should be creating a simulation platform, thinking on 10 years ahead. Not just the, the technology we have now. So what, what can we do is to use software that can, have been used for the International Space Station, for nuclear power stations, for the uh, LCR accelerator, and try to, to, to implement all of that technology for construction. Thinking that construction is a place where people don't like to spend money and all the best. Okay. Uh, so the, at the beginning, we thought uh, on the building interaction, so human models, uh, uh, problems with fluids, ventilation problems. So all the more sophisticated and difficult problems we do have in construction. Okay. Um, the idea at the BDTA after the Sphere project, because the Sphere project is finishing in a couple of months. Um, was to create a platform, the BDPA Association, in order to, to have uh, like uh, a standards defined for doing simulation in construction to reduce the cost of simulation because the barrier for using this kind of simulation oriented to real time was the implementation cost. We, we can be thinking about uh, 30,000 euros <laughs> Uh, if you want to do a simulation of a home, okay? we want to reduce that to, to in one order of magnitude. So that means to have in advance uh, components prepared, we call them symbols, and to have the standards of connectors. So if you have good libraries, good connectors, okay, first question. Yeah, but. Many software that do not the like the Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but I don't think it's. Uh, how, how can we. Uh, yeah. Uh, how, how can we connect the questions and all of that? Okay, so the question is more or less that you have been working for years trying to, to make your own standards and you still have problems. Yeah. It's correct. Every, everyone has a problem. Yeah. The, the point is, 
okay, the, the first discussions is just what you say. We have uh, those problems doing our own models. How can we go to the market thinking that we can reduce an order of magnitude? That, that's exactly the way. But the, if you analyze the time you spend preparing the models, when you receive a, a new equipment, you spend a lot of time reproducing the electronics, the mechanics, all of that. So if we can get the fabricators of those equipment producing those components, we could be saving 80% of the time. Okay, that, that is the purpose of this standardization movement, is to try to go to the market, to try to, to get the collaboration of the, of the fabricators, the manufacturers, and to try to reduce the price of the implementation in one order of money. It's quite ambitious, but it's the only way to do it. I mean, we have the technology, we know how to use it. It's totally useless because it, it is not affordable. Okay. More questions? Okay. Let's let's go to yeah. Let's go to to listen to this presentation because this was the. Like the first try to say which are standards is, is exactly that question. So let's go. Building Digital Twin International Congress 2022. Presentation for simulation workshop. During the video, four different topics will be analyzed. First, the definition of SIMBIN. Second, the use of SIMBINs for operation and integration in real time. Third, the standardization of inputs and outputs of the SIMBIN. And finally, the standardization of fluid properties calculation for moist air mixtures. A SIGMA is the mathematical representation of a real machine or equipment based on differential algebraic equations to simulate the real behavior of a system. The SIGMA can exchange information through inputs and outputs ports that can be of different kinds. Fluid, thermal, mechanical, or electrical. Simulants are generated to optimally perform in time and results when implemented into bigger systems and models. Thus, complexity of the simulants must be analyzed in detail to reduce simulation times while keeping results as physical as possible. A compromise between computing time and results accuracy must be met. This is meant to achieve far low computing times than real time while keeping reliable results. The simulants can be imported and exported from different technologies and protocols. Some of them are C++, FMI standard, OPC UA, web service and APIs, Excel, Python, MATLAB, or in specific software providing a legacy model. A very important point related to the chosen technology is the know-how provided with the component. Some technologies could require the equation system to be open and know-how is provided. If that situation is undesired, encrypted or black box options are more suitable. Typically, SIMBITs will have different categories of inputs and outputs. These are electrical signals, thermal signals, mechanical signals, <coughs> control signals, and fluid variables. It's also important to mention that a common or standard nomenclature must be determined in order to properly define and understand the variables being used and exchanged. Electrical signals will take into account electrical current and voltage and power consumption or generation. For the thermal signals, the temperature and thermal power can be used as inputs and outputs. For the mechanical signals, the torque and RPM will be exchanged in addition to the power consumption or generation. For the case of control signals, set points for temperature, volumetric flow or CO2 concentration are provided together with working mode, characteristic tables, or curves in different nominal or design values of the equipment. But what happens with the fluid variables? Depending on the type of analysis, we would like to perform either steady or transient or both. The equation system will be different and the fluid variables to be exchanged can differ from one situation to another. Then the main working fluid of interest should be selected. For ventilation applications, moist air is the chosen one. In addition, CO2 is added to the fluid mixture. Moreover, two different types of variables can be defined, state or flow. State fluid variables for moist air mixtures can be easily extracted or calculated from psychrometric charts or functions. The main properties that can be defined for moist air mixture are dry bulb temperature, wet bulb temperature, dew point temperature, 
pressure, specific humidity, relative humidity, density or specific volume, and enthalpy. Just knowing three of these variables allows to calculate the rest. This proposal assumes that CO2 concentration in the moist air mixture is very low and its presence doesn't affect thermodynamic properties calculations. However, not only state variables, but also flow variables are required to calculate the whole state of a system. Flow variables for moist air mixtures can be calculated using equipment curves and tables. The main properties that can be calculated are mass flow, volumetric flow, enthalpy flow, and pressure drop. As an initial approach to be discussed in the future, the variables to be exchanged through the input port and output port can be different. The ports can either be capacitive or resistive. Capacitive ports exchange state variables as the temperature, pressure, or mass fractions. Resistive ports exchange flow variables as the mass flow or enthalpy flow. Thus, four different combinations of input-output can derive. Capacitive-resistive. Capacitive-capacitive. Resistive-capacitive. And resistive-resistive. Depending on the equation system and the SIMBA technology, one configuration or another would be selected. Moreover, mass fraction definition must take into account four different species, oxygen, nitrogen, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. Note that the units of the fluid variables meet the international system. This is an example of application of the initial approach, where a fixed flow direction is selected according to design specifications. Important to mention that connection between different simits must meet the equation system definition to avoid convergence and integration problems or undesired algebraic loops. To end the presentation, a series of developments to be carried out in the future are included. First, to consider reverse flow situations. Second, to consider pollutants and other particles in the fluid mixture. Third, the possibility to implement water and refrigerant lines. Fourth, to include water in liquid and gaseous states. Fifth, to standardize characteristic tables and curves. Sixth, to define acronyms of variables. And seventh, to develop a performance certification to check validity of results in computing time performance. Thanks for your attention. Okay, this, this was like the, the proposed subject for the, the workshop. We had the workshop and at that workshop, they were only two companies. Stop. Stop. So the, the two companies at that workshop, one was Ternalia, they have a very big implementation of the uh, pilot project called Kubik. So they are testing continuously <coughs> the simulation they are doing, they are using Modelica. Bimola, Energy Plus, and I, I guess that's some programming as well. And the other company was TNO. TNO, they have their own simulator developed with a, a big library of components. Both of them, they were interested. They said, okay, we want to become members of the VDTA and we want to be in the working group of simulation. They were convinced about the direction, this idea of symbols, okay, and, and to be somehow creating something to standardize or to guide the development of symbols and to reduce the implementation price. And in fact, we have a proposal at the VDTA, a new proposal we presented it two days ago, uh, with the idea of promoting these symbols in a real uh, demo pilot and so on. But uh, as you say, uh, before, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, to develop the standard, we, we had to think on the mathematics behind the standards the fluid properties, the mixture of gases, all that stuff, even the, the symbols. You cannot develop any symbol because uh, if you are going to be working with them in real time, in applications in real time, because the idea was not to do uh, simulation just in the design, the idea was to pack the simulation in a, in a program to be embedded in the control system. At that point, the, the components must be uh, designed for real time, the, the conversion has to be very quick. So you cannot uh, you cannot spend too much uh, resources on complex fluid problems or or design problems of the components. Okay, 
you have to think on real time on a building and the building may be very very big okay that's one point um so we don't have a clear idea how to do it but obviously it has to be neutral we we must depend on the, on the format of the software it cannot be modelica or dimola or whatever it has to be neutral all the simula any simulation software could be, could be able to uh, to load the equations and the design of the component and to play with it or the, the other option is to have like a, mm. a mathematical standard and an implementation supplied by the bdta of third parties with the components ready to use in one to three platforms i don't know that is the basic idea but we have here to discuss this this situation so the presentation is here is it powerpoint uh, here okay presentation mode if you want thank you sorry no no it's uh, i think it takes uh, time it's, uh, okay we will uh, it's okay here yeah we have today uh sergio costa is connected online sergio costa uh they uh, he works in typhoon hill which is a company doing uh hardware in the loop okay hardware in the loop may be a critical technology when we speak about electric components because electric components they don't work at intervals of 10 minutes or 15 minutes most of the components in our buildings they they change very very slowly okay or at least we are not interested on, on you know quick changes we want to, to know the, the temperature of the conditions of one room, but it's not going to be changing very quickly. But electric equipment, electricity changes with uh, 50 Hertz. So you have two options. You can implement fossorial uh, implementations via software, or you can have hardware in the loop. So hardware in the loop can be very interesting if you are implementing like PV, photovoltaics, storage, and some other electric components connected with between several buildings connected with whatever hardware in the loop is an option and these people is very specialized on that um, we have kian here good morning kian uh, kian is working in kth and um, uh, we wanted to have him here because one of the problems is how people at universities is trained on simulation software and their possibilities okay uh, we have Raymond as well. Okay, Raymond was working uh, with uh, in, in uh, Galway University, so he has experience as well. Valeria, where is Valeria? Here. Uh, Valeria, now you are in a project integrating. Well, you are going to explain that later. Okay. Uh, Francesco, uh, Francesco is now beginning with a, a new project uh, coordinating grid districts. Very interesting. Um, finally, we have Raymond. Raymond was working in in, um, in his PhD. Correct me if I am wrong. Um, applying uh, uh, prediction with simulation to build this. So he has a very good feedback of the benefit, the economic benefit of using predictions and savings thanks to simulation. Okay. So um, uh, go back. Just like that. Okay, so I can, can I close it? Go here. Then the other one, the, the other presentation will be in this. Uh, okay. Okay. And Sergio is the first one. So here is uh, a summary in that presentation of. Uh, I have to stay here. Yes. Of what we expect. We expect a very slow progress. We are not speaking of a revolution. We understand that. Uh, not everybody, but many people involved in simulation. First, we have to synchronize our brains to speak all of, of all of us of the same questions. Okay, because, uh, for example, yesterday I remember at dinner I was speaking with uh, Daniel uh, from SPH of. Uh, uh, okay, but he was explaining to me that they work with uh, transit and what we were doing, and we were not doing exactly the same. Okay, so interesting. We have to synchronize our brains to say, hey, okay, we are speaking about simulation for real time. All our components must be thought for real time. 
not just for doing uh, like the designer simulation to optimize the component. No, that is not the interest. The interest is the building or the human models or whatever. So uh, first we, we need like a, uh, to generate the critical mass of brains thinking in the same direction. Okay. So that means a slow process, little by little. It's no hurry. Um, okay. Uh, we have to follow in a strategy to make simulation profitable. I mean, all people working in simulation, you have the experience that it's very difficult to sell simulation. I mean, you get a lot of information, a lot of knowledge, it's very nice. But as soon as you want to sell it, it's like, uh, you know, a barrier there that people don't understand you or, or they don't trust you. Okay. Okay. We have talents in front that is the coordination and storage in buildings. We have to solve that. We can solve that challenge with simulation. Okay. Um, why real time versus our flowers? Our flowers means to do like the estimation of the uh, EPC of one building. Why we are not interested in that? Well, we can do it as well, but uh, to be working in real time simulation means that we are focusing our attention to systems that can be in the market in 10 years, like interaction of humans with the ventilation systems, with the thermal systems. Okay. So instead of thinking on what to do for tomorrow, we must be thinking on what to do for 10 years ahead to be ready for providing those systems in the market. Okay. Um, yes, a, a final comment. Real dynamics and control problems affects the health of the people, not only comfort and savings. When we began at the Sphere project, okay, uh, the pandemic began as well. So we were in the middle of the development of the libraries for ventilation, thinking on the COVID-19. So at one point, we had to decide, hey, let's go to simulate contaminants because we can help people controlling the restaurants and the places the, to, to optimize ventilation. But finally, we, we said no, because it's not in the, you know, in the proposal, so we cannot do that. But that was a mistake. Okay. We have opportunities and, and the, I mean, the, the, uh, the profit we can get from that is huge. We can change the way people think on, on buildings. Okay. Just uh, uh, something that can, can be close to you. Yesterday we were in a room, in a workshop, and it's supposed that you are the most sophisticated people in construction, thinking on very strange things around construction. We were all together in a room and it was not well ventilated. Nobody was reacting. So there is something that is not uh, current. We had to change that. Okay. Uh, I think we were together in Soldac this summer, very nice place in near Madrid. Uh, again, the most sophisticated people around ontologies in construction, and it was the same problem. There was no good ventilation. Nobody was complaining. So there are like hidden problems that we don't care, but they are important because we sleep better when ventilation is good in our bedroom. Uh, we are not infected if there is a problem. So the, the importance of doing things well can be huge. Okay, so now let's go to listen Sergio. Are you there, Sergio? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, Hello. Although I, I still cannot share my slides, so I think, yeah. Okay, can you share your uh, I cannot share my, oh, yes. Uh, you have to click on the icon, even if you see a red line, click on it. Okay, perfect. We can see the slides. You are mute. 
Sergio, we can't hear you. You are mute. I apologize. I, I think you were seeing the wrong screen, so I will try to reshare now. Uh, now it's uh, yeah. now it's fine. The audio, but we don't see the slides. Yes. Now, do you see the slides? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Good. Uh, so, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, and and thank you, Pablo, for that uh, that uh, and excellent introduction and overview of the Symbot concept. Um, uh, as as uh, as Pablo mentioned, I'm I'm Sergio from Typhoon Hill, and we focus primarily on um, hardware in the loop solutions. So, I will briefly here go over uh, what we do, uh, but focus primarily here on uh, how we use Hill to help simulate uh, buildings and microgrids. What these sort of interfaces might look like, using an example from. Uh, the Hypers project that we are currently working on, and how this could look like in these future business opportunities that uh, Pablo was mentioning. So uh, Typhoon Hill uh, is a test solution provider which is focused on uh, high fidelity emulation of electrical systems. Um, so we work primarily with these uh, low level uh, power electronics as well as scaling up for uh, full battery energy systems, e-mobility, and uh, microgrid uh, applications. And our key focus here is on this uh, controller hardware in the loop concept. Um, what, we, what we have uh, primarily is our vertically integrated software, which is a combination of a hardware device and a freemium software that can be used to model both in real time and in a uh, simulation environment. Um, and I very much like what Pablo was discussing about this Symbots concept because we, we, we also really see that modular approach of using little uh, modules dedicated to specific devices and scaling from there as something that's really interesting. Um, we also do test automation, which uh, we use for simplifying testing in relation to standards. So as these standards are developed, we can use dedicated test cases to check that the behavior will actually work in real time. So what do we mean here by hardware in the loop? Um, what most solutions that we have today focus on, um, uh, especially in the electrical sector, focus on going from this model in the loop simulation environment directly to uh, these sort of more uh, operation modes that you see here on the right. Um, what, what we have here in the model, the ones on the left are more, uh, are the pink ones, which represent virtual representations, whereas the gray represents physical. And what we lose when we do this jump straight from the simulation and modeling to the physical operation is um, there's many uh, control errors and, and risks for systems not to actually behave as they would in the real conditions. And so we focus a lot here on this uh, controller hardware in the loop uh, testing where we're deploying this software on the real control systems. And I think uh, from what I heard in the presentation earlier, this is something that is a big focus of the, the Simbot approach as well. And uh, with this, what we do is we can essentially speed up the deployment process, save time, save money, and reduce the risk of uh, failures when you deal with real devices. And with the digital twin concept, we can take this a step further by going from the virtual demonstration of a, a virtual representation of a device in general to considering the real conditions of the specific device in the specific concept. We've so in terms of funded research projects, we've used this in several projects at the moment. I'm featuring just two here. <laughs> is the drive project which is already completed 
where we uh, worked with uh, other partners to provide a thermal modeling of an HVAC system and modeling of the electrical control systems. And in this project, the, the uh, building owner manager of an office building was able to validate that cloud control of the building would work and approve physical testing. Um, and we were also able to catch certain software errors in the cloud control prior to the physical test. So this is sort of the ideal case that we're looking for. And in this current hybris project, we've just started uh, this year. And, or sorry, we just started in the last year, but we're just starting deployment now. And um, in this project, we're looking to do the same, but for uh, battery systems. Um, and uh, we're doing both a digital twin of the two battery systems as well as of the demonstration sites. And uh, for this uh, pro for this presentation, I will be showing briefly um, what one of these virtual demonstration sites, as we call it, uh, can look like. So for this virtual demonstration site, the goal is to make a single model that can be used for both historical and real-time testing uh, and test several test cases, including uh, island mode, community energy management, and make sure that dynamic control of the real site assets actually works in real time. Um, to build these models, we just need a single line diagrams of the site itself technical specifications of the devices on site, inverters, batteries, grid connections, and live or historical data from the site to validate that the, the digital twin represents reality. Most of these are data that is already being gathered for digital twins. So this is why we see this uh, symbiosis between these two approaches. Um, the example model that we have here, this is one of the, the sites that we're looking at. It has um, a grid connection combined with several residential loads, uh, PV inverters, and a battery system. And as you can see, we take these four boxes and convert it directly into a model in the software. Um, this model can be deployed either in real time using a loop device or in non real time using a virtual, uh, we call it a VHIL. Uh, and this can run, when we're looking at things like thermal dynamics and slow uh, flows, this can run much faster than real time. So we can look at many cases at once. Um, these uh, components uh, can be easily parameterized based on the specific conditions of the, the actual uh, grid on site, which is why we use these technical specifications. This is what the digital model is. Uh, so how do we interface with it? How do we bring it to life? Um, one way is through our built-in SCADA system. Um, and this is an example of how that works. Uh, essentially, we run the model and we can see the power flows and we can see how the behavior would work in real time and uh let's zoom in on this battery example and you can see how customizable you can essentially in the software itself drag and drop uh drag these uh these uh percentages to different levels and control how the grid would behave under different conditions um we can also look at, for instance, uh, turning on and off a grid contactor. Uh, and so in this case, what we're looking at now is an example where the grid is detached from, from, the, uh, from the local grid and we're switching into an island mode. And um, we'll zoom in on this graph here and you can see that that grid disconnection took place on this first graph on the second graph we can see how the battery system immediately starts kicking in and taking over control of the grid and on the third graph we can see how no loads uh no devices no 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 pvs were disconnected during this event so this is an example of a successful uh switch to island mode um 
And this is just using data that we have from the site itself. Um, here I was showing an example of how we could control this via a SCADA system, but uh, just to briefly mention, you can control this by several other methods, um, analog and digital signals, um, test automation software, third-party integrations, including uh, FMI, FMU imports, C code, Python models, all of these can be easily uh, integrated. So uh, this is the sort of interfacing concept that we see for, for this software. And what does this all mean? Um, for us, what we see this is integrating all of these concepts in the digital twin, um, we see is critical for centralizing all the data gathering and models in a single place. And by combining this with the simulation software, we can give digital twins the ability to control a sort of sandbox environment, which is helps training SCADA operators. It helps testing these new control behaviors. We can also allow AI and machines to connect and send these controls themselves. Um, so it really accelerates the development. It really accelerates uh, troubleshooting capabilities with site data. And uh, we, we see this as sort of driving down that time to market for, for new developments, new technologies, new controls that are more robust and, and let us accomplish these, these, these new concepts that, uh, that we're looking to, to help uh, improve energy use and, and improve health in the buildings themselves. Um, we also uh, focus a lot on easy reuse and integration of existing models and exporting of data to other tools, uh, essentially to make it more accessible to the market as is. And that's something that we see as uh, really useful to go forward. So um, I want to thank you very much for your time. And uh, if there's any questions, I I, uh, I welcome. Thank you. Is there any question? Or we can wait for the end of the workshop. We can write down the questions. What do you prefer? Any questions there? OK. So uh, Sergio, stay there. and. We can go on. Uh, yes. Valeria was the next one. Um, Sergio, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Thank you. Which is the presentation is still... Uh... Okay, no, has no presentation, so... Uh... Ah, okay. So just uh, the video. The... He was okay. speaking. Can you have to speak here, okay? Yeah. So the idea is to have uh, somehow feedback from the academia on um, how they face the problem of training people in simulation. So you can describe what you do yeah. and what... The the problems you find that yeah. we all are what we'll, we'll, we'll be doing in the future okay. uh, so thanks pablo i will shortly describe a little bit uh, our role as a university how we how we train or how we teach uh, uh, energy system and building hvac system simulation in swedish uh, environment uh, maybe you have heard about kth uh, it's one of the biggest engineering universities in sweden and we actually supply one third of uh, engineers or industries in Sweden. So it's a big uh, basket to pull people into the society after they graduate. And uh, uh, our department is working very much with energy system simulation, especially for buildings and basically heating and their in connections with uh, electric grid. So simulation is actually one of the key, say, portfolio of our teaching, uh, teaching pages and the, the, the students they have go have have, been, have have to go through all the courses from elementary levels to the advanced levels 
But uh, in KTH, uh, in our department, when we start the teaching, we have different tracks. It, it, this is based on the levels of the students. So bachelor level, so first cycle, second level, that's master level, and also the third level, that's PhD students. And, and their goals and our approach are quite different uh, and the expectations from the students. Of course, the training process is different. For example, when we come to the bachelor student, there is a very strict requirement or expectations how we should train them to do the simulations. Because simulations, for example, for HVAC system and building physics are very important for their bachelor degrees. This means that they are not asked to really develop something new. So the main target for them is to understand how you can utilize an existing tool to simulate this. For example, when they simulate building physics, they, they need to use a tool to simulate the mode growth, for example, and how they can develop a real beam models, for example, for a building or several buildings, and how you model the HVAC system using an existing tool. And when it comes to tools, traditionally we have been very much focusing on two types of tools. Maybe you have heard about EDIs. Uh, that's actually partly developed by some researchers back then in KTH. And, and, and so we have good, uh, uh, good experiences with EDIs. And then we have transits also as a second option to, to train the student. But here, they are not really asked to, to, to cover additional contributions when it comes to simulation. The reason is that most of the bachelor students after graduation, they will go to industries, they will go to societies. So it's very important they have the skills of using a tool to model something, okay? Then when it comes to master level, it's a little bit different concept because in their master thesis, this is very close linked with the collaboration of companies or industries or municipalities. So the need usually come from the industry. This means that they need to use the existing tool, but also contribute, contribute something to develop the simulation method a little bit based on the need of the society or the industry. For example, if you have a transit modeling, then you usually have an existing project then you, need, then you need to understand a little bit on top of modeling this HVAC system, what new component you can develop or what new cost analysis optimization with the district heating, the, there need to be something new coming out to use the tool and help with developing the tool itself based on the need of the industry. So this is how we usually uh, train the simulation and so expectation for, from the master student. And in the end, it's a PhD student level. That's uh, quite different and, and complicated. This is very much, uh, as you know, research project driven, but uh, we don't train PhD students in the conventional way of uh, bachelor student or industry driven way by the master student. This is really developed by the personal interest of the PhD student itself. This means that what we pull from the beginning is that you derive, for example, non-stochastic equation on the whiteboard, and this is the fundamentals. Then whatever tool you choose is not important. And whatever simulation platform you choose is not important. And, but for us, it's very important, the tool or the simulation itself, at least for us, is transparent. This means that the research work need to add a clear contributions of the tool itself. It can be written by a tool that is developed by your, yourself, like using Python. If you have good data, you can develop different data-driven tools or physical-based tools. But it's very, very important that the PhD student develop a tool themselves, not just use it or meet some need from the industry. And when it comes to learning curves, it's really different because for bachelor students, it's driven by the teachers. So you tell them what to do, and this is the outcome, you will get the degree. But the, for the master students, the collaboration is important. They, they have to learn not only to do the academic job, but how to work with other people in industry. Understand how your work can help with the companies, help the society. So this uh, uh, things on top of the simulation work itself, they need to have this understanding. What your simulation method and tool can help make a contribution in, pra in practical work. 
And for the for the PhD students, of course, this is maybe you have all done that. So this is very uh, research project driven. So you, you actually need to develop the tool. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Is the presentation you would like to? Okay. Yeah. Do you know the title? Of the... Yes, okay. Okay. Yeah. Only one thing. I would like to switch to. Sorry, one second. Okay, but then I will just uh, include such a slide. I want to swap this place because I want to collect this. Okay. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, also, for the people who were not there at the beginning, um, I am a researcher in a research institute in uh, Messina. Uh, so, Pablo uh, asked me just to have something uh, really open. So, I will try to. Uh, give our uh, experience uh, mostly with research projects because the institute uh, I work with um, is mostly focused on the research project. We have less industrial uh, project and maybe other realities in uh, Northern uh, Europe, like in KTH. So we mostly work on research projects. Um, what we have seen recently, or uh, I mean, I started relatively recently working on research projects. So five, six years ago. But what uh, I've seen uh, so far is that there is uh, that starting at the beginning uh, simulation in the research project was more standard stuff. So uh, there was the need for uh, having uh, uh, some design, some planning of the system, um, some even kind of check of the pre-monitoring of the system or the expected performances. And right now, moving onward, uh, there is much more need for integration of the simulation with the rest of the parts of the project, meaning that uh, there is a need for real-time simulations for uh, um, control purposes, for uh, fault detection. Uh, also, um, even when we go to more complex systems, uh, to make the right choices among, for example, different generators or uh, different uh, set point options, um, or even uh, uh, if we are looking at uh, some project that we have done recently about uh, heating uh, and uh, electric grid integration, whether you want, for example, to charge a battery, charge a storage, or uh, start a generator, of some point to have a whole view. Uh, and this means that there is the need not only for the uh, building um, simulation model, but also the components, and they have to somehow um, be able to uh, talk each other. And the point is that, for example, in uh, one of the projects that we have together also with the Kian and that Francesco, I think, will present afterwards, Hypergrid. We, um, at proposal level, started with an ambitious idea so that we will create one platform um, that will include the model of the um, district, the model of the components that will be uh, in the district, the model of the buildings that are in the district, and they all should be somehow able to um, communicate. And now we are almost one year since the beginning of the project. And of course, since these, uh, for most of the partners, one of the first experience of things like this, uh, we are still discussing about which is the right way to integrate uh, all the tools. And we still are facing uh, problems uh, because, of course, uh, some Mm, from the industrial partners, there's the need, as Pablo said before, that some data are encrypted, uh, while from research partners, uh, there is fully um, compliance with open source systems. We need to have the right connectors. So I, I think even in the future research project, there will be still a lot of discussion about this because I, I think this is a need that is just now being created. Um, 
but I think this is uh, in the end, this is uh, where we will need to find some solutions because uh, it would be crucial. Um, on the other hand, my question in general, my I think that the main challenge is is how to convince the industrial world to accept something like this. Because I mean, which is the right way, the right um, levels of stakeholders to involve in doing this? Is this the uh, people training engineers, like Kian was saying, uh, so through universities that at master and PhD level somehow are involved with uh, industrial realities? Or is by um, trying to convince companies, starting maybe with local uh, realities and then going towards the um, big players in the market? Or uh, in the case for my species, I'm talking about HVAC and storage systems. And there, the issue is that uh, I think most companies will already have and have developed for years their own tools and to have them change their mind, to have, uh, so how they, they, they produce the, now most of them produce the beam models, for example, of their components, but to produce these uh, symbols that Pablo was asking, uh, or was talking about, would be more complicated. One other challenge or one other way could be to act, uh, for example, at European level to dedicated um, lobbying or uh, uh, standardization activities. Or maybe the solution is that you need all of these at the same time, uh, which is uh, quite uh, complex. And on the other hand, maybe uh, another option that uh, I have been thinking about in the last period is that one could act not maybe directly on the producers of the uh, HVAC equipment, but maybe on the BMS uh, partners, because in the end, um, maybe uh, each producer is uh, um, relying on the hardware or the software produced by someone else, uh, especially the smaller realities. And this means that by acting on this level, it's possible to indirectly influence also the equipment producer. Uh, so this is to me the main challenge. Uh, I think that right now, if uh, there is a chance, I mean, yesterday I've been uh, attending a workshop on uh, um, where, uh, I mean, they are creating a, a big consortia for uh, open test bed uh, um, uh, ecosystems. Uh, where several realities with um, uh, testing capabilities on a certain topic, so buildings mainly, or uh, facades, whatever, are creating a, a big uh, ecosystem where all the private uh, companies, especially SMEs, can go and ask for testing. Maybe the idea could be to start thinking about something similar on the simulation um, side. So to have a big consortium of, uh, in this case, RTOs that can provide modeling and simulation services with some um, level of standardization to these kind of companies. So that is my message. My lesson. Yes. Okay. okay, hello uh, everyone. I'm Francesco Milani. I work in the innovation department of uh, ARC, which is a uh, engineering and consulting company located in Barcelona. Uh, and I'm the project coordinator of, uh, of Hypergate, which is a research and innovation action project which started uh, more or less one year ago. 
uh, that I'm working with uh, together with uh, also Kian and Valeria on, uh, on this project. So actually, I will uh, I will be giving a very short introduction of the project, and then uh, Mustafa uh, from KTH will help us will help me uh, talking more about the um, a case study that we we can discuss in this uh, in this context. Um, so yeah, the project is carried out by 19 partners located in these uh, seven countries that you see in the map, and we develop solutions for um, sector coupling, so for um, thermoelectric integration in smart, <coughs> in smart energy districts, um, developing solutions from TRL4 to TRL6, more or less. Um, so the general objective of, uh, of the project is to develop and integrate um, renewable-based solutions that can uh, enhance the deployment of what we call smart hybrid energy networks, which is mainly a coupling of uh, thermal and electric networks based on the fourth and fifth generation um, DCT and cooling models. Uh, as you can see in this picture, we are uh, shaping our activities, mainly focusing on three different layers, which are not bubbles, but are very interconnected with themselves. So one layer, one layer is um, developing hardware, so physical solution, uh, which is um, actually uh, the leader of this layer is more Valeria. Um, so we are developing uh, three different hardware. One is a modular heat pump with certain uh, phase change material storage. One is a sorption storage, so long-term energy storage, thermal storage. And while and one is a small small scale uh, combined heat power with the steam engine and steam buffer. Um, these hardwares will be assisted by a bunch of several tools and services, um, of which the leader is, is actually Kian that you that you know already. Um, these hardware uh, have the function of uh, mainly optimize uh, in general the operation. And management of the district and also to optimize the design and decision making phase when we want to for example or introduce new new type of technology in a, in a district um, then there's a third layer which is the platform of platform so basically um, we want to make sure a, a final user that a final user can access the tools uh, in a unique um, having access to a unique uh, platform so not so we want to we want the tools to be accessible in a unique uh, in a unique um, page. Let's say, for example, a web page. Um, so as, as you can imagine, we are dealing with a different type of uh, simulation, which can be hardware uh, modeling, uh, software simulation, and in this uh, for the sake of this presentation, we we decided to to present. A specific use case, which is the one of uh, of one of the pilot, which is Keso, uh, located in uh, in Poland. Keso is a district of um, is a very small district composed of um, three three buildings, which are um, office buildings. Of, uh, there's also an hotel, and um, there are some laboratories. And um, we are making a simulation uh, of the system. To optimize the the general operation of the of the um, eating system mainly. So um, Mustafa will uh, uh, more uh, deeply about this uh, this scenario. And um, we'll be here for any questions. Thank you, Francisco. So uh, hello, everybody. Mustafa from KGH. So what you see here is the first milestone that we are going to share, to validate uh, with our partner, uh, Casual uh, Lab. So the, this is actually a subsystem, and it's real. So it's driven with the BMS. And we want to optimize the operation of the thermal grid with uh, electric grid. So through uh, uh, some flexibilities on the grid. So the flexibility that we found is the heat pump. So we can drive the heat pump optimally to uh, optimize the, the operation of both electric uh, grease and uh, the soot heating. By the way, we don't, our partner has no real desert heating, but he has, we, we will emulate a desert heating using um, a boiler with a, with a storage system. So driving the heat pump, optimally, this is not a, a 
and use topic. This is somehow the last recently many uh, with quick and mind many uh, approaches talking about this and many uh, methods are already validated. But the, the idea is the new idea is how to drive a real system to do this. So our partner has a BMS, as I said. This BMS is a classical BMS, means it's closed. So the data uh, flows from the field to the to the SCADA system and goes back. It's enveloped system, so we cannot. Th th there are gigabytes of data being generated uh, every day, and no one takes advantage of this data. So the system is op operating classically, so there is no optimization. So our idea is how to suggest hardware and software solution to take advantage of this data from the real system, not from a facility which is open for research. This is a real system. So our idea is to overtake the BMS, uh, deactivate it temporarily, fetch the data from the PLC, from the, uh, the controller, and start there, use the hardware, which is uh, simply an edge controller with a big capability of computing and storing data. And then we can integrate many inputs, online inputs, uh, our optimization algorithm. And uh, we start first with unidirectional data. We just visualize data. We don't uh, control because it's a bit sensitive. And then when everything is fine, then we can make it bi-directional, uh, as you can see here, by the dimensional flow of data. So we fetch the data, we store, we optimize, we visualize uh, through smart devices. And then we send back some control actions to the to the heat pump just to to drive the heat pump optimally along with other units. So um, the heat pump is, for example, is operating according to the electricity price, according to the uh, heat energy availability from this heating, according to the weather forecast, according to, for example, some uh, information coming through API from a digital twin or something like this. So, so this is the idea behind the our approach that we hopefully are going to validate in the next uh, few months with our partner. Yep. Then I, Francisco, yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah, because these are some challenge, general challenges of the project, but are not interesting for this uh, for this context. So thank you very much. If you can send to me, it's better. I'm not sure. My computer is not uh, reading the recipe. Doesn't like it. It just doesn't read the USB and okay. uh, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I need, uh, yeah. Yes. Thank you. Do you need the Wi-Fi? Just you're connected. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. Me, I am connected. I just open this. How to convince industrial? That is a key point. And um, we had during this year created many meetings with uh, manufacturers, uh, explaining them the idea of consumers. It looks like they are more or less confused uh, with the CFD series, so a lot of software around. They don't have a clear idea how to go to the market, how to, they must hit the market with They have a clear idea, they have. They must provide uh, the green models in 3D. Okay? That's a clear idea. But about the functionality, they don't have uh, more or less, they don't have any strategy for doing it. So we have no I, I don't think that universities is the way. I mean, universities, they must see simulation. But if you go to universities thinking that you are going to be producing the technologies in the industry, that is the wrong way, and in my opinion will be very, very useful. Company, I think we should go there. 
and uh, how to produce the change in how companies can invest in investing money on simulation. Well, uh, we had a meeting some months ago with uh, Summit of BDP, and he told me that in, in Finland there was a, a construction company, and they said that if the cost of implementation of monitoring and all the you know software you, whatever you want to put there is less than two thousand euros for a, a normal home they could be you know able to, to spend that money just because they are adding value to that home so as soon as we get uh, a marginal uh, price of the product we can go instead of money the problem is if we try to sell simulation, that is complex. Nobody wants to buy it. If you put simulation included in hardware, you are selling hardware. It's another business. So that could be the solution anyway. Today, nobody knows. That's it. Uh, about if you will, uh, because you mentioned, if we could go to the new level, well, that's what we are doing right now. Okay. Um, and DNS producers, correct, that is another way. We were speaking with Snyder, and um, it looks like Snyder is not interested in uh, uh, residential homes by with less than two hundred and fifty dollars per square meter. That's something okay, that can change. But the, and, and we had some meetings with banks as well, and it is very interesting. Banks are in the same line than construction company. If this is a marginal price. If you can convert your simulation and stuff. Uh, embedded in, in uh, BMS, in marginal cost, they will be able to spend money financing renovation projects. Well, hello everyone, I'm Raymond Sterling, and I'm the managing part of our solution. Speak, uh, okay, I start again, sorry. So, uh, I'm Raymond Sterling, I'm the managing partner at Arton Solution in Spain. Um, yeah, I'm gonna talk a bit about my own experience with simulation. Um, this title was provided by, by Pablo, so how simulation can help predict thermal inertia and how to play with it. And uh, during the course of this uh, workshop, I have heard many, many people talking about the, you know, the advantages, we know what it is, we know more or less how it's been taught in universities, we know how you can integrate in European projects, but also I, I pick up the initial uh, mention by Paolo is that it's very, very hard to sell. And it's very, very hard to sell because people see it, at least this is my feeling, that this kind of a black magic stuff where you are predicting the title with it. So, and that's, that's because we are not, Lately, uh, in my opinion, it's a very, very personal one, um, in universities and, and in courses, we are teaching students how to use tools a lot. We are teaching them how to be quick with them, but we're not really teaching them what is under the hood of the tool. We're not teaching them to, so much of the basics. And that's my experience. I get, I have gotten master students, PhD students that I say, okay, forget the tool. Let's sit down and talking about inertia let's draw some differential equations and let's try to solve the problem by hand. And they just can't do it because they forgot about calculus because we haven't told them like, this is the use of it. Because if you talk at 17 years old about calculus and 19 years old calculus without any use, okay, they solve the equation, there are mechanics on it and they forget about it. When they get PhD student level, then they need to use it and that's where it gets hard. And decision makers, when they become decision makers, if they don't have that knowledge, then they see building simulation modeling or any type of simulation modeling that is not for a critical system, but it's also always for, uh, remember that buildings are not normally critical systems because the ones that are, they are very well controlled. But the rest of them are not critical systems. So people just don't want to spend money on it. Simulation takes time, takes money. So it's part of what the reason why. So I have, I'm gonna talk about some points about the inertia problem, how you can use it, how you can, uh, best way that I feel that, that you can do it. And that comes a lot from my own research when I was a researcher some years ago, and, and from my experience now on, on, on the industry side, trying to sell also simulation <coughs> services to, to companies. So you see there energy plus, Dynamola, et cetera, et cetera. But going back to my initial uh, 
uh, statement. So what is thermal inertia? How do we model and simulate all of this stuff in, in, in the building? So how do we teach students to simulate it? How do we take account the weather, the gains, internal gains, solar gains? So you, you just cannot. And we all know that one of the big problems of building a simulation is that normally the problem has more parameters than variables. So at the end of the day, you have many solutions you cannot calibrate. And the model, the predictions that you make are always more or less qualitative, but quantitatively, you never can get to the real reduced error because you're just looking on a crystal glass. That's that's just what it is. So it's just a different, difficult um, issue to convey when you, we're always very cautious when we're selling it. So this is not the final solution. So this one of the solution that we think, because we know about the building, we think it's more or less like that. Uh, but we are never committing that that's the real one because you cannot see, you know? So uh, how do we, sorry, how do we model uh, thermal inertia with basic model, no? So we go to the basics, basic RC model, that's it. But it's very good sometimes that we go back to the basics and we both go back to understanding on, on our softwares, how this happens. Is our software modeling the thermal inertia with differential equations or not? Is our software static or dynamic? We need to know this kind of stuff for in order to make good predictions because if we to play with the dynamic elements of the building, we need to make sure they're modeled, they're modeled properly. And many tools don't do that because they're not made for that. So we also need to know that we're using the right tool for the job. And that's something that only looking at the documentation, only looking under the foot, we can do that. Many models are 15 minutes, 13 minutes steps because they're not modeling. They don't need to because buildings are slow, are very slow to react. So you just can go on a static way. So it's good to do it in Daimola, we can do it in Modelica, we can do it in many tools in IES, uh, we can do it, but many others, they don't. And of course, many models are done in the spreadsheets. And of course, that's not the way. In any case, once you understand how the physics works, you have, in my view, three model types, no? White box, white, white box black box, and the mixture. Lately, um, I don't think I have to tell many people which one is what. So white box, we do. We model the physics as best as we can. Black box, we let the machine learn about it. And the white box, we combine it. And the ones that are having the most success lately are the combined ones, the, the gray box ones. Because you somehow use expert knowledge to, mod to model the physics, the dynamics, everything, everything that you can see. And then whatever you cannot explain or when you want to calibrate, you use a black box for it. So you use the power of computational advances, you use the power of AI, and you use that to complement your model. And those are having quite a bit of success because they make a bit uh, the accuracy that you have from a white box model, or you expect to have from a white box model, with the efficiency, computational efficiency of a black box model. Because if we want to integrate a model in a BMS, if we want to integrate a model in a PLC, it has to be very, very efficient. We all know that. So we will have a very nice computer, but when you go to, to real life, you don't have computational power and you need to solve the model in power. If you want to do MPC, this is something that Artron we are doing a lot. The step between simulating it and going to the real uh, hardware, as the guys from Typhoon Hill are doing, uh, is a complicated step because you don't have the same resources. So that's something we have to take into account as well. One thing we can use model for a lot, and that's something that we all know from academia, is a virtual testbed. We all develop this because we want to train, we want to do MPC, so we, will we want to have something on which we can play with, but we're not going to break anything. So that's why uh, many, many people do it. So the, that's, I think, for me as well, is for models, for simulation, is kind of the, the comfort zone. So we do, you develop a model, you see what's happens if you change you change the other thing we change how behavior how controls behave you see everything you can see and then you make decisions qualitative not normally decisions about it so how do we use it at the end of the day so data generator so we get our building data and whatever data we cannot get from the building then we get from the model and we have um, virtual sensors we have uh, different scenarios that, that we can model that we cannot get on the real building and we see what happens if we do this we do that we do everything but the thing is that we always need the little person thinking about it and we also need to make sure that that person is trained to use the model that person is trained to use the building which many times they don't but 
we can use uh, also for control testing, like the guys from Type 4 here are doing a for simple model, and we see the real controller how it will behave. For it. That's one of the best scenarios that we have. Found. If we want to go one step forward, we integrate both and we put it on the MPC. We put it on the controller and we do control the building with it, and we have some models for predicting models to, for controlling the building. That's what the guys like. Box AI are doing, uh, that's the guys also from Siemens and Schneider. They have predictive controllers that they install, they have models in it, so <coughs> it's already there. It's expensive. Uh, many people don't trust it because we normally trust what we understand, but we don't know what is inside. So we inherently are not going to trust something that is going to predict and drive the building by itself. That's something that happens often, and we have found many, many times that issue with, with building managers. But it can be done, and it has been proven many, many times. It has been it's used a lot, of course, on, on energy efficiency measures testing. So uh, certifications, any type of certification, we use models for that a lot. But bear in mind that most of them are not used for dynamic, not use dynamic simulation. We don't use inertia at all. We just want to see it's going to get hot, get cold, and voila, and we go ahead. Um, now with the digital building logbook, with the new tools that are coming into place and the efforts also from the from the Digital Tuning Association, we are making people think about, yeah, the inertia needs to be thought of, needs to be integrated, we need to see the building is fast, is slow, because otherwise we're gonna overheat it or overpull it and we're gonna be uncomfortable and not ventilating properly. So we have all these problems. We can use it for flexibility analysis, not that type of flexibility. Flexibility, the energy flexibility analysis. So we can use, of course, the inertia, the best part of the inertia is to shift energy consumption from when we don't need it to when we need it, okay? Um, that's something if you have modeled your inertia properly before with your RC or whatever tool you're using, then you're gonna be able uh, to try to predict the flexibility. So basically, and the, the main uses of flexibility, uh, sorry, that, that's the main, Use it for inertia, and then um, the main benefits I see. I'm gonna close with this one. The main benefits I see with, with playing with, with thermal inertia um, first, starting and stopping the building when it makes sense, and using the inertia to either pre cool or post cool or whatever you have to do. But at least you're not on a schedule. When you're not on a schedule, then you are saving money. That's one of the things that we, we have learned, we have modeled, we have simulated that sometimes a 15 minute shift for a week, it's a lot of money. And with the rising prices of the energy, even more so. We do energy reduction during operation. Uh, this is what many of the people uh, in European projects are going crazy to do and trying to do. So let's model the abilities properly so we really can understand, okay, can basically, if we stop providing heat, for example, if we're heating before we reach the set point because we know the building is gonna get there. So we know that, but the set points, the, 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 the thermostat, they don't know that because they don't have the model. They just see it comes, it is stopped, but then it's too late. Flexibility management, when you have it, preheating or, or, or with the cooling. Um, yeah, basically we, we, we know more or less uh, how that can be operated. We know that if we can turn off the building and we know it's gonna take an hour or two to get uh, below set point, so we, we can use that to, to turn on turn off the, the primary systems. And then if we have, and we are playing really with the inertia, we are sure to improve comfort. And this is a topic that is very, very, very uh, up to date right now, because even uh, the, the war and the problems with the gas, we know a lot of people is gonna be very uncomfortable during the winter. So people is starting to take more uh, importance to how comfort inside the buildings. We know improve health, it improve uh, production, productivity, improve many things. So we start to start thinking how we use the models, we use the systems to really make sure that people is comfortable at home. And for that, we just need to, to model it. And I, I'll shut up, I just wanted to say just all those words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You decide when you want to take a break. Uh, your, uh... Yeah, we can have a break. We can post it on. I think so, but uh, I think check. Okay, questions, quickly. I mean, uh, the fruit of this meeting? Can you please uh, speak uh, 
to the camera. What do we want with this workshop is people in the VDTA working in the simulation group. This is going to take a lot of, a lot of time, so a long time. So I, we need your collaboration. That's uh, the question. Uh, suggestions or questions now? Yeah, Daniel. Excellent. Um, what happens many times is uh, uh, this is the case of TNO, I think. Uh, correct me, Edward, but they had several projects. They were collecting components, and in the end, they don't know what to do with them. And most of them, they are parametric, they are generic components. Because when speaking about symbols, we can have generic, parametric, or specific. Specific means that there is a, a manufacturer responding. Of those of that model or that is the idea okay so we can have many people in the same situation that they they have collected many models they don't know what to do with them and it is a stupid to have in a box so that is uh, good news okay. we can collaborate with them um more things more questions about the market about the bms resellers there Uh, something about Raymond presentation. You didn't mention the numbers of uh, savings applying thermal inertia. In because uh, I remember speaking with you years ago, you told me that the the uh, savings just switching off the heating at the right time in one gymnasium maybe it was like two thousand three thousand euros a year of savings is money. And I remember another funny situation with the demo pilot in Holland. Um, they, they, they made a fantastic home okay, uh, with a very good isolation. And they discovered people opening the windows <laughs> because they couldn't breathe. And the heating was still on. <laughs> it was, the isolation was so good that just with a little bit of sun outside, they couldn't breathe. So that is a, a control problem, basic control problem. If they can predict that the sun is shining, they have to, to cut the hidden. So, funny problems. Yeah. Yeah. Human human models. We uh, basically we began with uh, human models used in our space. They are uh, and DTT. They have a human model as well for thermal. But the problem is that it has like 5,000 equations. <laughs> and that was unaffordable. Uh, they, well, they were using 
their server and VTT, so they got to connect the data with the server back. Totally uh, commercially, and uh, I think it's, it's not, uh, uh, you cannot propose that. So the idea in the sphere, the best human models we designed were to use in real time. So we had like two basic human models, one for ventilation, another one for thermal. Thermal was a, a functional pro, model with one node, very simple, because another model we had for aerospace, they have like 24 nodes, and they were very complicated. They were thinking on the, the suites, and they were very complicated. So in the end, we decided that it, it has no sense to have one space model in one node and to have a human model with uh, uh, 24 more nodes, it has no sense. So the, the thermal model is uh, is quite uh, studied and, and verified, and whatever. But the ventilation model, we discovered that the, we could be doing the ventilation model using a CPX test, which is a, a test we can do running or with the bicycle. So you can get from that test the, the curves of oxygen, CO2, and the metabolism directly in kilowatts per hour. So we decided to, to have that approach, is to have like a, a specific CPX test for one human, so you, you perfectly know how that human, with name and surname, is behaving. And from there, we could derive like generic human models based on populations, BNI, age, and uh, weight, things like that. So we could have like generic, parametric, or, or less specific, and specific human models. Thinking that you can have your, your model in your watch or your in activity, uh, uh, whatever, I don't know. And, and you could be interacting with the building with your own parameters. Okay. And that was working. And another, another interesting point is we, we uh, implemented the human multiplexer <laughs> because you have to move the humans in the, in the, in the room. So we implemented a multiplexer and you could be moving the humans in the rooms was working fine. In any case, Paolo, I think that you perfectly introduced the next work of this is going to be talking about bios. Yes. Well, we're talking about big bin, what we are doing, minutes. where we are, and then this is the big brother. Okay? Mm -hmm. We are talking to have proper simulation and government poison. We need to know what people are doing instead. What you're talking about, people are talking about other people. Okay? But it could be our own, it could be my own.
with the with the privacy metrics we are nowadays acting with people from the European Parliament. So at the end it's important that we start to believe okay that this is a good channel. Okay, we, we put it all them together and I think it's a really, a really good way. So thank you so much for your time. Let's make the coffee okay, and, and let's be discussing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, yeah, the ten coffee minutes. is downstairs, so uh, if you can be on time in 10 minutes, 15, because people will virtually need to, <laughs> to be connected. Uh, Hi, everybody. Connected. We are at a workshop about the privacy. Enjoy it. Uh, you have to put the video first. The video, okay. Okay. Once. One. I'm using workshops. I'm using metric tools. Advanced home control systems developed at Sphere with software in the loop. Advanced control still is using AI to improve validation, increase sensor robustness, and to improve occupancy and video interaction. This means a privacy concept by design, originally designed to comply with privacy limitations. The European Parliament on the 5th of April of 2022 and the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in a Digital Age IDA published a resolution about on artificial intelligence in a digital age. The ETA Privacy Workgroup will propose a privacy metric tool to help in the design of these systems in construction. These are basic documents which may be used to prepare the workshop on the 26th. Some of them are summarized at the DPTA Doc 6 in the Privacy Metric Tool in Excel as presented at Document 7 file in Excel and Word Help file. The objectives of the workshop on the 26th are basically to prepare the draft for first standard in case that partners agreed on the general methodology. Further discussions may define more aspects about categories, items, and scores. But an agreement about the general approach would be a great step ahead. Mathematical simulation is used in advanced real-time control in complex problems of environmental control and life support systems. In Sphere Project, a residential building is considered with all its functional aspects, passive buildings, ventilation, heating and cooling, external meteorology, and humans. The same model may be used for design, commissioning, and exploitation of the building. The model can be compiled in a deck with a simple user interface of inputs and outputs in real time, something of 10 to 15 minutes. The building has a limited number of physical senses which are interacting with the simulation deck model. Calculations are made on high step by step every 10 or 15 minutes, providing analysis of the house in real time. We can extract secondary magnitudes, residuals to detect deviations, implement predictive control, or just other values not sampled. The simulation model can be located in small electronics at home with no need of communication to the power, but it may be hosted in a server using web services as well. Some controls can involve human ventilation demand. This can be done with wearables interacting with sensors in the building. This information may be very sensitive and hence a privacy development need to be implemented. The view of the systems involved may give an idea of the complexity of privacy content estimation. We will have sensors in several rooms of the house. This number is typically around 10. Sensors may be connected with Zigbee protocol and may have their own calculations in the edge instrument. They could be directly to connect to Internet IoT. We will have equipment such as a home ventilation machine which have their own sensors and connectivity. Media service may be supplied by a service through internet. We will have a simulation model in the form of a deck with inputs and outputs and with an AI implementation. We will need a signal concentrator, gateway, Wi-Fi, and internet router. A mini PC could be supporting and hosting the BMS and the simulation deck. We need to create the simulation model and that need an engineering service to be provided with previous information taken in the field. And finally, we will need extra sensors and validation tests to make sure our model is representing well the reality. 
In our case, and taking into account the Ida Committee resolution of the past 5th of April, we could describe our system as follows. There is no special risk associated with those designed document. Liability may be directly connected with the product and services supplied by a company. The model used is compiled, but it may be studied component by component, using libraries which programming is known and supported. The values we see in the deck are decisions to simplify the user interface. But any value can be made public. Human supervision is needed to help in the validation and analysis of the service. In this supervision, processes special care with privacy must be taken. More precisely, this privacy tool is directly helping to get some of the objectives of the EU Parliament Commission. It will serve as base for a standard. It is a way to mitigate risk. It can create certainty for developers and EU companies. It may create an open certification platform providing trust. It can be a risk-based legal framework. It can provide a way to make a risk assessment during design processes. Research must continue to get standards permitting good levels of privacy by design. We propose a new way of data processing in the edge. We have tested these methods in demo pilots of Sphere project. The privacy metrics tool draft is provided in Excel format with a help in Word. It includes some basic examples to understand how it works. You will find in columns the so-called categories. Inside each category, there are items and scores. Calculation is made using these scores as it is described later. What is privacy content? It is impossible to measure privacy, but we can implement a way to evaluate the level of privacy comparing situations. We divide the big problem into segments or categories. Applying an algorithm, we can get a number representing the privacy content. Categories would be the aspects involved in the calculation. We are working in this first draft with six aspects, entities, magnitudes, statistics, sampling frequency, data use, and data control. An item would be an occurrence inside that category. We can only have one item in each calculation. Items are exclusive. We can find many items in the list and increase to consider all possible options. In some categories of data use or data control, the number of possibilities can increase a lot. It will depend on new uses and control options which are continuously being developed. associated with each individual item will be a number which will be considered in the global privacy metric formula. Numbers must be understood in order of magnitude and in a differential way. As soon as you define the value of one or one of the items, all the rest are established in relation to this item. One of the categories, magnitudes, represent the privacy content included in different physical measurements. To give the final estimation of privacy content, we will be multiplying the scores of categories, entities, magnitudes, statistics, and sampling frequency, and by scores of categories, data use, and data control. An example could be this one. Detecting human presence in real time from home to owner. In this case, we would have entity equals human score one. Magnitude equals three presence score one. Statistics equals sample data score one. Sampling three equals less than min score one. Data use equals storage in house score one. Data control equals individual control score one. The final value is one. If we consider five as a risk limit, we would this result privacy compliant, acceptable, or any other classification. This will be the view in the Excel file. It is important to mention the relationship between privacy metrics and data ownership. Category data control is indicating who is controlling data. The owner controls his per data and at one point may want to sell, report the set of data. 
you know that must have tools to provide the right privacy content in that set sold to third parties and tools to manage the sale process. This may be a selling process P2B or recording P2G, P2G process, but in any case, privacy content must be known and controlled. Certified processes by independent third parties, the ETA, may be critical to initiate this data market. Okay. <clears throat> One previous explanation is that we produce these videos in advance to have the workshop around something. So I, I think that uh, because this event is after summer, you know, everybody's on holidays. I didn't know that I had to, to uh, coordinate it. Well, it was a disaster. But anyway, in future, uh, in the Dedic or in other workshops, we will publish in advance the videos of the contents of the workshop. So you can come here with ideas or with problems or, or just collaborations or whatever. Uh, uh, as you have seen in the video, uh, of course we face problems uh, doing the mon monitoring and the implementation of the control system, and all of that in the sphere pro in the sphere of project. The idea is to have uh, a response to the problems, not just okay, just to stay quiet to say hey, we have problems for the for the PP. No, we have problems because the implementation, especially in the demo pilot in Poland, uh, they had to do some contracts contracts with the stakeholders, the construction company. So that was horrible because they were delayed months and months all the signature of the contract. So finally, it could be like two years, more than two years of delay. And we didn't have any data of those, of those uh, houses. So uh, on the other hand, uh, the contracts were only around the data. But what about before taking the data? How do you collect the data? Because, of course, in this case, data were offline. But we wanted to produce data online, an interaction in, in line, in real time. So what happens with the privacy in those, those cases? Okay. So we implemented the tool. Uh, it's just not a standard. It's just an implementation uh, which, will, which will, will be presented in the same group in three months or six months, I don't know. But the idea is to have these workshops with collaborations, people just voting or just collaborating with us. Uh, the idea in the workshop in May was to say, hey, this tool can be useful? Yes. Uh, do you think that the organization with categories, entities is fine? Yes. Uh, do you think that the algorithm can represent the privacy level? Yes. Okay, stop there. Because now the real battle is to define the items in the categories and the scores. So that is a real one. So we have to wait there, we have to stop, we have to begin the, the implementation in the work group of the standardization, and then it will be the time to discuss all this matter. Okay? But we have to drop now. Yes, so yes, the question to the privacy itself. So it's, if I correctly understand your algorithm, but this is the first time I see it. So uh -huh. Sorry, I asked the previous question, but it's. Um, so you define the kind of the sensitivity of the data. The more it is frequent, it is the more valuable. Yes, uh, there's well, we, we will see this too yeah. practically. I will show you an example. Yeah. Um, we have Andre as well, he's going to, to be speaking about a similar problem in our project. But the idea is as soon as you have a category and you have to define one score of human, you can calculate. You can estimate the privacy content of the other entities in relation with that. So, if Q1 is one, a district, let's privacy not here. So, it's like force money to less. But this is the battle for the standard. Okay, so we have to stop there. Of course, we need a draft to show, hey, we go in this direction, but this is not the standard. Right. And then your goal here is to be compliant our rules that the person, so the privacy is the personal yeah. privacy. So, so we want the human being to be exposed that 
if you know that this guy is in the room and uses this amount of CO2, then you know that's wrong. No, because you really <laughs> That's the problem is that nobody was uh, uh, studying or taking into account the technical problem. It's not uh, just the problem is it's not that you are taking data of the CO2 in this room because it can be done by a machine there. And nobody cares about the machine. I mean, the machine is in automatic mode. So the frequency of that problem is zero. You don't have any problem, right? The problem is you are taking the CO2 level of that room, you are going to you are sending that value to the cloud, and somebody else can go inside there to see what is the CO2 level. That, that may be a problem. So nobody is considering the chain of decisions, many design that uh, you are taking for doing that. So this is a solution for doing that. It's a, it's a, like a tool that you can use when you are designing the system to say, hey, this is not privacy compliant. Yeah. Yes, uh, I mean, we, we have this similar problem in because we have to believe that some are easier to do Some are residential districts, so actually it's a real people's data. And there was a solution we were thinking that this, uh, as we said, the problem is not collecting the same to data, but the problem is the communication of the data because we need to push the data to someone. And this well, it is a process, you have like different that is a theory. Yeah. You have like different steps when you are generating the data. I mean, the first category is. What is it about? You are uh, estimating a human or estimating a symbol, or you are, I don't know, it's different. Because a symbol is something unreal. So, uh, privacy content, may, well, it's an unreal, but it can be represented in a real human. Okay? But it's not real time, it's not real. So, you have a comparison with one, it's like two orders of magnitude. So, and you are considering only. What you are estimating. Second step, which magnitude? Because it's not the same if you are measuring pressure or you are measuring the demand of CO2. Okay, it's different. So you use this I think differential privacy scope to estimate this scores. With the statistics, mean value, uh, real time value, mean value in one day, it's not the same. Sample frequency. And in the end, you have like two big categories is data use and data control. Okay, so the algorithm is multiplying these four scores and dividing by these two scores. Okay, that is the algorithm that in the, the last workshop everybody said oh, it's okay, could work. Okay, we can present that to the same group. Anyway, I, I will be doing this calculation for you by hand with, a, with an example, okay? And if you want to have this available, I can send to you this, this part, right? Uh, so, yeah. Just, just one thing in the matter of GDPR, we, we developed, uh, or no, we set up a project for the monitoring of the construction workers. Um, and we submit the project and it was denied because just was one sentence. It is not GDPR compliant. So we uh, say we get a little bit angry with that. Uh, so we did uh, uh, a study uh, in order to identify what would be the possibility of the GDPR compliant in the electronic quality monitoring of construction workers. And it is all about profiling for numbers. That is the key elements. In, in this in this aspect because if you are going to profile so if if we know that the weight the pressure is from Pablo it is one thing if it is from a person that is in the room it's completely different so but both are feasible and both in accordance with our study can be achieved one is that there must be an agreement for people that know to understand that data would be collected, but it's not profiled. So 
are here today. We just signed an agreement saying there will be a sensor. So the, the, the room, the nobody is Pablo, me, Edward, but it's about 30 people that are here. Yes. So the CO2 that we can capture is from 30 people. Yeah. We don't know the weights, etc. It's medium. So but what, what you were mentioning about the, the if we want to blow fast, then it is, I'll say, a long uh, way around. Uh, but it is feasible. But it is feasible to, to, to do so. So it is all about blow fast. And another yeah. situation that it's just particular for construction workers, if I want to measure uh, the productivity, and this is, this is good because when people write GDPR, Data privacy, etc. They are not thinking on what to think and today. And if I'm on site and I'm measuring the productivity of construction workers, basically a screen will be looking at him that is working. So this is the invasion that's happening nowadays. By changing, it's just setting some uh, sensors and let it work. So no one is looking directly and directly. We have we can have the profile or not, just sign agreements on that. And well, but this is the thing that we need to balance. Okay, we have privacy issues, GDPR, but what is being done today? What is being done in terms of productivity measurement in construction sites since the beginning of time? It's three persons double checking one work eight hours a day. And yeah. the story of my life. Everybody's checking me and I'm doing all the work. <laughs> uh, if you sorry, want, sorry, sorry, sorry. if you want, Andre, you can speak now. Pedro, you, you can speak about uh, uh, general uh, protection regulation. And in the end, if we have time, I show you this uh, metric tool. This metric tool is specific for home monitoring and taking into account that we are going to have uh, sensors and artificial intelligence working there. Artificial intelligence means if this human is moving and I detect that he is moving, I have to increase the ventilation uh, flow. Okay? It's a basic artificial intelligence, but it is. Okay. So, Andre, okay. Thank you, Paolo. And uh, good morning again, once more. Yeah, I'm, I will be standing here. Good morning also to the uh, remote audience. Um, let me start with uh, seeing um, that I'm honored. I think it's a privilege to uh, participate in this, uh, but you already uh, announced, Pablo, that during summertime, uh, things could have been prepared differently, etc. Well, to tell you a little secret, I was not even supposed to be here. Uh, I am second choice for this uh, presentation because they asked for somebody else, but uh, he said, well, I don't think that I'm the right person to talk about this subject. So, Andre, could you do that? So I said, well, I'm there anyway, so uh, why not? To be honest, when I was preparing uh, the presentation, then I thought, well, I think that Jasper would even have been the better person. Uh, but anyway, since I'm here, I'm going to share some experiences uh, with you. Because I was really uh, listening with uh, enthusiasm, uh, the first part as well. And in the Netherlands, we have a saying. Uh, in Dutch, um, een vreemde eend in de bijt, which is literally translated in English, a strange duck in the pond. Which means, well, what I'm doing here with all those intelligent people, very detailed, and I have a complete different angle, uh, I would say. But since it is a workshop, uh, it could be of interest, because already by now, and also the, um, the tool that you presented, uh, Pablo, I think that's very useful. It, it would have been very useful already in some past uh, previous projects uh, that we have done. So I think it's good to, to share these uh, things. And again, if there's any uh, remarks or questions, uh, please make it, uh, let's make it interactive. Um, this we will skip. Well, first to introduce myself for those who don't know me yet. My name is Andre van Delft. Um, I'm the director of Demon Consultants. And maybe it's good to explain a little bit about Demon Consultants, because then you better understand the take that I'm having on this, uh, this topic. Uh, Demo Consultants is a privately owned company, an SME, uh, based in the Netherlands, in Delft, and we do actually three things. We develop software for our clients, so real estate information management. 
We do consultancy and surveys, so collecting data, come back to that, and we do research. Uh, and within that combination, we try to come up with enough tough, uh, solutions for our customers, um, mainly in the Netherlands. And one can think of the Dutch governmental building agency, provinces, municipalities, a lot of housing corporations, um, hospitals, so actually organizations that own, use, or manage real estate, and, and preferably a lot, because there's where our added value lies. So um, it might be a bit of a strange combination, and that, that's what competitors often uh, tell us as well, these three disciplines, but the game you could say that we are playing is really try to help daily uh, operational uh, problems to solve that for our, our customers, but at the same time, don't stick with the traditional ways, but really look ahead and uh, be innovative and see what is around there and try to integrate it in our software solution, the RE Suite and our services. Uh, so that means sometimes, well, we are working on stuff that maybe 10 years from now on will be introduced. Maybe it will never happen. So we should not be too fast, but not too late either. So therefore we are experimenting uh, a lot and, and we encounter problems uh, like this. Um, again, when I was preparing the stream duck in the pond, to be honest, I was wondering, what is a digital stream? Um, because, well, I'm not an expert in it, but we notice uh, that that is used quite a lot, uh, this term. And it is not criticism at all, but it is good to realize what our customers, what the organizations, uh, what I have to explain. Because you gave the example of getting a demonstration case, signing all the contracts. That's very much true. He noticed as well for housing corporations that, well, we have this great initiative and we have some uh, demonstration cases uh, and we want to uh, use it for a digital twin. Then they say, well, what is a digital twin? Mm -hmm. So there, there it already starts. Uh, and again, it's not criticism uh, at all, but it maybe helps to understand the challenges that we are encountering. And there, I think, privacy, that, that's really on the top list. While even our customers, they do not really know what it exactly is pinpointed at. And to be honest, I st still don't know either what is really uh, focused on uh, this privacy. So what is a digital twin? And is it about building um, and its users, or one, uh, or the latter, or a combination? So I very well remember, uh, and I'll come back to that a bit more in detail later on in this presentation, I remember very well a workshop that we had, I think it was five, six years ago, in the European Research Project called Mobistown. Uh, and there, there was a um, professional lawyer specialized in privacy. And she gave this workshop uh, to us. To be honest, we ended up with more questions than answers, <laughs> as always, because there were some very intelligent people uh, in our consortium, and they said, yeah, so what is it about? She said, well, it is about um, you cannot share and, and I'm explaining it in a bit oversimplified way now. You cannot share the data about the users, etc. Okay, but could we share the um, the data of the buildings? Yeah, that's no problem, etc. But if we can find out who is living there in the building, then it's not an anonymous. So what are you talking about privacy? And then she said, "Well, you have a valid point. Literally, it is like this, but I fully understand." But so. What I'm trying to say, it, it is a very gray area, it's difficult to explain. So ready for ourselves, but also for the customers that we are trying to well, uh, implement those concepts. Uh, so is that some, some general uh, notes, uh, like I've stated. And then again, what are the characteristics of digital twins? Um, is it, you've seen some examples uh, this morning and yesterday uh, as well. Is it a geometrical uh, 3D twin where there's some interaction? Is there added data? Is it live or not? Or close to real time? Is it one or bi-directional? I don't know. I think it's many ways to define and to make use of it. Um, and there I will just share some examples uh, of what we have done and what we have done and what we have uh, encountered. Um, like I said, we, uh, one of the things that we are doing in DEMA Consultants is, is doing European research. Here are some examples of research projects that we either coordinated or participated uh, in. 
So MobiStyle is there. Uh, that was actually the first one where we were dealing with these kind of things. Uh, and uh, again, to provide a bit of information about my, my background, the background of the company, uh, I've talked about our software solution. It's called RE Suite, where RE stands for real estate, so buildings and civil infrastructure. And Suite is literally a collection of apps, applications, servers, um, services, whatever you need to uh, facilitate all kinds of processes that you have when dealing with real estate. It could be multi-year maintenance planning, energy efficiency, sustainability, uh, liability, um, financial analysis. It's a platform that, again, is used in practice. Housing corporations, Port of Rotterdam, government, Schiphol, uh, they used to use it. And we integrate it almost always in the research projects that we're participating in to have a jump start to build upon and of course to enhance the products that we can implement that. And that is actually, like I said, the game that we are doing, combining the research and the pragmatical solution. So therefore, I think the added value uh, of our company is that we encounter practical um, challenges of our customers. Um, it's a bit of a reality check, you could say, in the research projects and the other way around, we can come up with a different solution. But this, this is the core uh, that we always use. Um, a BIM, is it a digital twin, question mark, or not? It is not, <laughs> but a lot of people think so. Is it an add-on uh, to BIM? Is uh, a digital twin a BIM model with interactive data, or could it be even something digitally represented without a BIM? That's also an understanding uh, or uh, use of it. So. Again, um, our software, um, we have uh, equipped it, we have enabled it to, to deal with, um, uh, with BIM models uh, for generating based on artificial intelligence, for example, but also to use it for visualization, analysis, quantity takes over, and collaboration, and whatever you uh, can think of. So with a bit of fantasy, adding the sensors, uh, well, I could say to my customer as well, our software is fully digital twin or is it more something like this like photogrammetry uh, because that's something that we included as well in the software and they're adding sensors and real-time uh, feeds I don't know it could be both it could be a combination so that's something that we are still together with our customers uh, are exploring and and just trying to go for use cases that are beneficial uh, for them so MobiStyle, um, basically, in, 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 in one sentence, this project was about energy savings, health, uh, and comfort. So what I uh, really liked in this project, I think a lot of us are working in energy uh, savings and, and comfort, but what the University of Maastricht found out, uh, diabetes, one of the really increasing diseases uh, in the world, the insulin uh, resistant, um, or um, how do you call it? The, um, sorry? Yeah. So uh, a lot of people are taking uh, medicines uh, to control their, their, their blood uh, the sugar level. But what I did find out, find out is when temperature is alternating, it influences in a positive way 40% uh, the effectiveness of those medicines. So, so let's imagine it's just varying from 17 to 21 degrees. They first tested it in a lab, and then we tested it in uh, some buildings. So th that's what really uh, hit me. Uh, I thought this is really something that, that could be a game changer or really added value, next to the other things, uh, of course. So the challenges, the objectives in the, uh, the project that were really um, uh, um, with a lot of impact, but we had to deal with a lot of pragmatic uh, issues. Because what we did, of course, you want to uh, to measure the temperature and their influence uh, during management system, etc. At the same time, people were wearing wearables that we wanted to connect in an ecosystem as well. So all kind of interaction of data flows. I have to remind you, it was like six, seven years ago when we started. Uh, so the objective was to create a system with low cost sensors. Uh, low cost has an advantage. It is low cost. But it has a disadvantage that it's not that stable, it is not really um, homogeneous. So we had to deal with a lot of pragmatical uh, stuff. What we did do, 
uh, we focused on, on the performance of the data transmission, the quality, of course, and the reliability. And that, on the end of the day, that turned out to be, again, back in the days, one of the major challenges. It was not so much about collecting the data, but how to make sure that all the sensors were still working, whether they were uh, transmitting all the data on time, whether there were gaps in the data, and that could influence the quality of the data, etc. And we did implement that in a um, couple of demonstration cases. It was a hotel in Italy. It was a residential building, so a housing association in Denmark. And it were apartments in the Polish um, uh, um, area. I, I believe it was a war shower. Two or three hundred buildings where we had to collect data. And it was a fourth and a fifth, but I already forgot. So I hope that you forgive me uh, that. Um, but different languages, different uh, stuff, different local suppliers, and especially those days, it's not like shipping a plug and play here. So it, it, it needs to be taken care of proper installation, proper uh, control, uh, etc. So we more or less shifted the objective uh, of the tool, not so much in an, uh, analyzing the data, we did that as well, aggregating, etc., calculating uh, KPIs, and that is touching the topic of, of privacy, of course. So we really had to make it anonymous uh, and aggregated, uh, and there we could use it. But again, the, the, the tool proved its real benefits in controlling uh, the data flows and quality. And there, of course, we were dealing as well what is allowed um, uh, when thinking about uh, GDPR privacy rules, uh, etc. So it was a combination. Of, of several aspects that we had to deal uh, with. Um, and therefore, I, I did not know uh, your tool, Pavel. Uh, I just saw it 10 minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> so it would have saved a, a lot of trouble, I would say. So I, I really welcome uh, the idea to, and I fully understand that this first, um, uh, um, a first version, uh, as you explained. And while well, there's always pros and cons, but let us just start with something, and it always can be better, etc. But we should take some steps and then fine tune and improve, etc. So again, I, I really welcome uh, that initiative. Yeah. Um, so again, it was not only about uh, privacy, uh, but it was related, and again, it was six years ago. Now uh, there's a common uh, action that uh, the IT world compelled compared to the real world, uh, it goes seven times faster. So every year, it is passing by seven years in IT of development. So you really have to be agile, uh, flexible. Luckily enough, there is a lot of, um, of tools, and protocols, and systems uh, available uh, now. But I think that we will encounter another problem that it's not a matter of, of getting the data, but it might be too much. And how are we going to deal with it? For what purpose? Uh, and again, the privacy. So, um, BIM speed. I was asked uh, that that was the first connection for this workshop. Uh, how did we deal with privacy and the digital twins in, in BIM speed? And again, then I was thinking, well, did we have digital twins? And hearing my introduction about what is a digital uh, twin, you might uh, understand um, a question on that. But luckily, Sonia is here as well from Cartif, and I did not ask you before, so uh, don't be scared. But what Cartif did, uh, they combined uh, the IoT with the BIM models, and they made the uh, via a platform a real-time um, uh, connection uh, and data flows, etc. If I'm correct, but yeah, okay, because <laughs> I have to add, I'm the technical uh, coordinator, so I know roughly what's going on, but not all the details. Uh, but I'm very impressed by the work that is done. By so um, I think that we uh, could say indeed that we have uh, digital twins, uh, IoT. But again, a digital, digital twin could also be something, in my opinion, even without a BIM uh, model. So what uh, my company, Dima Consultant, did within this project, we developed a so-called inhabited app. And here you see some, some screen dumps uh, of the tool. And it was not by an inspection of um, uh, professionals. It was not IoT at all. We just simply asked the inhabitants. Uh, and I have to explain. The BIM Street project is about uh, renovation uh, in a BIM-based way, uh, you could say, more or less. So then it's very important to be refurbishing uh, anything. 
that you know what is the situation in the dwelling, what is the opinion of the inhabitants, etc. And of course, to, to connect with them at uh, uh, several purposes. Sure. Um, we encountered again, of course, GDPR. Uh, you're not allowed to ask uh, uh, anything. So, in this uh, respect, um, and we should do it after the workshop, I'm very curious what demonstration case in the Netherlands it was that you were talking about. But in this case, it is one of our clients, um, a housing corporation called Stack. And uh, their portfolio, uh, we have two buildings that we fully equipped with sensors. Uh, we did uh, scanning uh, and we also tested the uh, inhabitants app. And in the beginning they said, yeah, well, that's, that's very cool uh, because we are really going to use it as a service to our uh, inhabitants, our clients. But it also saves quite some time and therefore costs for, for our own employees, uh, of course. So far, so good. Then, of course, we asked the inhabitants, we want to participate. Yeah, really great. And then we had to explain what are we really going to do. And then, as Wardo said, well, not everybody was that enthusiastic to share data about what their children were maybe doing. Or So we did do it. Um, but, um, and that's some things um, that come into my, in my mind when we talk about privacy and these kind of things related to the Bim Speed uh, project. So for that inhabited app, of course, they were informed and they had to provide uh, consent. Uh, and then you're perfectly okay. At least that's what we hope. <laughs> we still do not know how it exactly uh, is. And uh, privacy and purpose specification. That's very important, not only to explain um, uh, to the people that are providing the data or that you're taking the data from, not only to explain what it is used for, but also, in my opinion, to, to create the added value for other analysis, et cetera. And there I saw some examples this morning as well, and also in your, uh, in your metric uh, system. So I, I can only uh, confirm that it's very uh, valuable, it's very important uh, to think about and to take it into account. Of course, data security. I do not know whether it is really privacy, but it's not secure. <laughs> privacy is, is breached. Uh, and of course, the overall uh, ethical uh, compliance is how are you dealing with them. So those are the things that we were dealing with. And just to give you a very simple example, uh, the inhabitants app, before they were replying uh, uh, those questionnaires uh, themselves. I will finish. I will finish. Um, so uh, it's, it's a very simple uh, form where they um, gave their consent and also the data storing, of course, all kind of uh, security uh, measures. But then, well, you should be okay with the emphasis should, because again, it still is a bit of a gray area in our opinion. So that's what we had to deal uh, with. Um, from that moment on, you've seen some other projects, but right at this moment, we are working on Precept, uh, G2EPC, Smart Living EPC, uh, easier. SRI, and fortunately, if you want to know anything about us, <coughs> please ask Peters. He knows way more about it than I do. Uh, and reincarnate that is about circular economy. That's what we just started, and there we are using also scanning and data. And there, of course, privacy is also very important. So you could say that the greatest common uh, divisor is uh, for all those projects that we're collecting real-time data. We aggregate it, and we analyze, uh, we analyze it, inform steer or influence and that is the bi-directional uh, way and of course there it's very important uh, uh, to arrange that properly so in my opinion from the experience of the Euro european research project and the pragmatical uh, uh, solutions that we are providing to our clients i think partly related to um, uh, to privacy the challenges nowadays are do we have reliable platforms um, in performance and stability, etc., are there reliable uh, data flows? Are they secure? Because when transferring, well, it could happen something that you do not want to happen. Interoperability, and uh, we've seen it before this morning. All kind of tools. How can you make sure uh, that everything is uh, working as smoothly as possible uh, altogether? And there we need standards, apologies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The purpose uh, I've addressed it already, and well. For us, last but not least, there has to be a business case, uh, of course. It's, it's not a common angle from an uh, uh, academian uh, point of view, but if you really want to create impact and, and make a success out of it, this is important uh, 
price and you never can start too soon with profiling a business uh, case, I would say. And of course, two other uh, things, last but not least, it is about ownership, who owns the, the data and liability. I can own it. And uh, so I'm perfectly okay that you can use it, but something is going wrong, who's going to blame? So um, this was my last slide. I hope that I'm in time. I hope that I somehow matched <laughs> the, uh, the topic uh, of today, but okay. Yeah, Taylor, do you want to present? Uh, Eva told me that you were 